1940, the success of the Nazi Blitzkrieg had left Britain locked out of continental Europe. The Reich ruled from Poland to the Pyrenees. Britain was weak, so a full-scale invasion of Europe looked a long way off. But in preparation for that day, Winston Churchill ordered the formation of the Special Operations Executive, a secret organization that would work behind enemy lines, attacking military and economic targets, or in Churchill's words, would set Europe ablaze. Agents were trained in sabotage and guerrilla tactics. Many were to fight and die in total secrecy. But some returned with extraordinary stories to tell. This is one such story. In late 1939, the war correspondent for the Daily Express in Paris was George Miller. I felt ashamed of being a war correspondent. I didn't like um, stopping when the French chaps whom I was with on outpost duty uh, went out into the bled, into the no man's land and left me behind. I didn't like being a war correspondent. I wanted to be a soldier. After the fall of France, Miller returned to England and resigned from the Express. He joined the army and was sent to fight in North Africa. He had only been there for two months when he was captured by the Africa Corps. Because I was doing outpost duty when Rommel advanced from behind the Tripolitanian frontier. I had just taken over from the armoured cars of the 12th Lancers. Well, if the 12th Lancers got hit, they could piss off. But in brand gun carriers, you were quite slow. You know. I was picked up by a patrol of the Africa Corps. How did you feel when you were captured? Oh, terrible. <laughs> terrible, I can tell you. Terrible. In 1943, Miller found himself on a train heading for Germany. He had already made two escape attempts and had been classed as a dangerous prisoner. Now the Nazis were shipping him to a maximum security camp. Together with his friend Wally Binns, he decided to try to escape for a third time. The train started off going to Koditz, and we could see the lights of Munich through the windows. Wally then walked to the loo, and uh, down the passage, in fact, and I crawled between his legs, while the others all prevented the Austrian sentries from coming forward and looking too closely. So they were all at the end of the carriage, and they were, only had rifles, and they were sitting, four of them, at the end, the far end of the carriage. Stupid fools. Then we opened the window, and um, he um, got out onto the step, and I got out onto the step, and Wally jumped, and I jumped, and, and we landed and found ourselves doing neck rolls down the embankment. Wally Binns was recaptured while the pair were crossing the French border. But Miller made it to France successfully and met up with one of the SOE's most effective agents, whose code name was Xavier. He was British, but he'd been sent as a youngster to a tour, and where you learn the best French, you know, without accent. And he spoke accentless French. Before the war, he'd been uh, secretary of the Lisbon Golf Club. <laughs> He was one of the best agents in France, no question. Xavier's web of resistance contacts helped Spirit Miller through France and onto neutral Spain. On his return to London, Miller immediately applied to join the Special Operations Executive. Initially, they weren't interested in taking him on. Well, people are chary of newspaper men in other walks of life, you know. Why didn't they want to take you on? I mean, surely you would have been the perfect candidate. I, I thought so, because I, I knew my way about in occupied France, and that was already a huge thing, you see. In France, the resistance, the Maquis, was growing fast. The SOE recruited and trained agents to go to France to coordinate their activities. Miller was accepted and was sent on a series of intensive courses that covered everything from bomb-making to parachuting. Towards the end of his training, Vera Atkins, the SOE's intelligence officer, gave Miller his new code name, Desiree. That so-and-so Vera uh, had given me the code name of Desiree, and so I just refused to go with that code name. So there was a lot of hoo-ha, and 
uh, just the day I was going, they said, by the way, your code name has been altered to Emil. So, thank God. Why did you object to Desiree so much? Well, looking like I did then, like a girl, to be called Desiree was a terrible sentence. Terrible. Wouldn't you have thought so yourself? Gosh. Now happy with his new code name, Miller's mind turned to more serious matters. Well, it's not worth thinking whether you're going to come back or not, is it? And I didn't know what to expect in, when I parachuted in, you know. And chaps were very often captured on the ground where they dropped. It happened that my ground was ideal, a long way away from Dijon and other towns. And Miller landed in northeastern France, not far from the German border. His orders were to meet up with an agent codenamed Albert. Well, I had no idea who Albert was, and when I met him, of course, well, he was horrified to see me. Rendezvous were always a tricky moment. In a world where security was everything, the fact they knew each other was dangerous. I knew his former identity, you see. Actually, he's the court, Mars Sancier de Brouville, and <laughs> a very ancient and fine French family north of where we were operating. Three days later, on the 5th of June, 1944, resistance groups across France received messages ordering them to attack railways and roads to disrupt German communications on D-Day. But first, Albert and Miller had to move to a new safe house before they could start their operations. On the way, they were stopped by French police. Because of the D-Day notice, some chaps had been making big bangs on the railway. And so the gendarmes were patrolling, and two gendarmes arrested me. And, um, of course, in my haversack, I had 3,000 quid worth of French money. And, <laughs> And they said, where did all this money come from? And the, the chap had his fist back, ready to bang me in the face, you know. So his companion said, stop a minute, who are you? And I said, I'm a British officer, just been parachuted in. And so they had a whispered consultation, and then I gave each of them a thousand francs for their wives and families. and. Um, uh, Albert then came back, and he, I left him with them. And he said, oh, we've got two new recruits for the Mackey. <laughs> Having finally reached the new safe house in Mushar, they were soon able to mount an attack of their own on the railway. We made up charges to derail the train. And um, down we went to the railway, and I set my um, copybook, How to Derail an Express, on the what I thought was if the French trains would keep to the right, put it all on the right-hand rail going towards Paris. Along came the express on the left-hand rail. What had, I hadn't known or been taught was that the British had built all the French railways and they kept the trains going to the left. God's truth. So I just changed the, the explosive round and blew up one that was coming down. The attack on the train had used up the last of the group's charges. A few miles to the north was another Maki group who were well equipped with guns and explosives. They lived in the woods and the Nazis knew nothing about them. But the group needed someone to teach them about bomb making. George Miller leapt at the chance. It was a small Maki and they were young men who knew nothing, you know, and I had to teach them how to lay charges and how to use the Sten. The man who had set up the group, Georges Moll, was an older and more level-headed character. Miller liked him immediately. He had a real idea of security, because he was a countryman, you know, and also of discipline, because he'd been in the Armée de l'Air uh, all his adult life. Moll was wanted by the Gestapo, and so couldn't even sleep in his own home in Veilly. He still lives in the same house today. In 1944, he was anxious for help in putting his cache of explosives to use against the German army. 
Avec les, les, les maquisards, il, il était bien, il y en avait toujours un qui... There was always one who wanted to ask him questions about weapons and explosives. As he'd done the SOE training, he was very useful. He had one hell of an English accent. There was English written all over him. A tall, blonde, good-looking chap. 100% British. Especially when he came dressed in his London clothes. I said, you can't wear that. Absolutely not. I bought him some peasant stuff and told him, you must wear these. As the Allies began their big push inland from the D-Day beaches, Miller and his group found themselves ideally placed to sabotage a major German supply route. German transport was coming through the Belfort Gap and getting reinforcements up to the channel for D-Day, you know. And it was really a very serious assignment. Together with four young Makisar, Maurice, Le Frisé, Le Pointu and Philippe, Miller set out to sabotage Besançon railway station. There were 18 sets of points to blow up. So um, I did uh, 18 charges and I took the first nine and I gave Maurice the second nine and I drew a, a diagram of the point, showed them where to put the charge. The mission went according to plan and all 18 points were successfully blown up. But one problem he hadn't counted on was the enthusiasm of his young team. As we were leaving, <laughs> uh, first of all, the Frise broke away and made a fool of himself boasting all around the town. And secondly, um, as we were going through the towns, Philippe, the very tall, lanky one, held up some people who were listening to these wonderful bangs going off and said, City do, la resistance, you know, typical French boastfulness. Following on from this success, Miller's men set out on a campaign of sabotage which brought German rail transport in his area to a virtual standstill. As the Allies advanced through France, more and more recruits joined the Mackie. Conditions in the woods were spartan, but relatively safe. One rainy night, Miller and Moll were tempted back into the village to take shelter in an old ruined chateau owned by Moll. This proved to be a near fatal mistake, as the Germans had received a tip-off and were moving in on the village. With the Germans advancing on the village, Miller and his friend Georges Moll needed to find an escape route. The Germans surrounded the village. They were all around. Those buildings there didn't exist then. The Germans surrounded my house and we crawled all the way up from the old chateau through people's gardens to hide in the sewer that runs right underneath the whole village and comes out on the hillside, in the woods. But Moll was worried that there might be Germans at the other end of the tunnel. So they were trapped in the sewer. Above them, the Gestapo searched the entire village. You could see through, it had orifices all the way along, but people used to, in the old days, used to fling their slops. But George had warned the, the others. <laughs> speaking through the orifice that nothing was to go down while we were there. You know. <laughs> Miller wasn't happy. He said, it smells in here and we're filthy dirty. Well, it was confined and bloody uncomfortable and damp in places and, you know, and it's not very, it wasn't very pleasant. But to be safe is the main thing, isn't it? I was scared that the Germans had seen us and might fire up the tunnel. So we went to a bend in the sewer and stayed there. 
After more than eight hours, the Germans finally left the village and the men were able to come out of their hiding place. As the Germans retreated across France, more and more troops were funneled through the Besançon area. To hinder their retreat, the Allies began to drop new weapons to the resistance. One weapon in particular interested Miller. It was a rocket launcher, but uh, that arrived in the Mackie and entranced me. And just at the time it arrived, a, a petrol train had been reported down on the Dou, um near the outskirts of Besançon. We walked through the night, you know, and about four o'clock we were in position to attack the train with mitraillette and this rocket launcher <laughs> so, and rifles. So um, uh, I, I took up a position along a bank the way you would in the army, a very good position, and uh, I had a loader putting the rockets in and then I let fly at, the, at these wagons. So um, the rockets hit the train, but it didn't explode. So I reckoned there was no, I thought I could see holes in the tanker, but there was no uh, explosive fuel inside it. So and the Bosch, meanwhile, were firing at us like buggery from the railway line. So I withdrew in military style. <laughs> Having been beaten back once, Miller decided to take another approach. The next day, he planned to attach limpet mines to the petrol tankers. He took with him a 19-year-old Mackie recruit called Nono. Nono and I set off on bicycles across the hill to a marshal, and then we were on the main road, and fairly, um, perhaps, a mile and a half outside marshal, when we ran into a a really serious German roadblock, which was obviously because I'd done it the day before, so it was my fault that we ran into the roadblock. And um, I said to Nono, turn around, quick! And we swung our bicycles round and were heading downhill with the hill in our favour. We were going soon very fast and Germans were popping up out of the cornfield on the left and at the edge of the forest on the right and shooting at us. But by some miracle, I wasn't hit, but poor Nono was. And um, I went on down the road, uh, switched the bicycle into a bank on the right and got into the forest. Why they didn't get me, I cannot think. It must have been lousy shots. They even had a machine gun opened up, but it, uh, by that time I was in the undergrowth, I think. And, and then I, you know, when I heard someone coming to follow me, I let off two rounds in the SOE manner uh, in that direction. And whether I got him, I don't know. Miller found out later that the Germans had executed Nono on the spot. He felt personally responsible for his death. He wanted to get into the Mackey and came and asked me, and I'd actually uh, got him into the VAA Mackey. So I, you know, it was pretty, pretty ghastly. Thing. Miller's weapon that day was a Colt 45, a resistance favourite. Georges Moll still has his pistol. Uh, I gave all my lads one of these Colts right at the start. A fantastic weapon. Our saboteurs weren't really cut out for close combat, but we carried the pistols for self-defense, just in case. The SOE had given Miller full weapons training, and he was a crack shot with a pistol. One day he had to put his training into practice. I was walking back through the forest of Chaillou, our forest, uh, on tracks that we knew very well. And we'd just come over the ridge and were coming down towards Vieille when um, we, we ran into this German NCO 
He was a fully equipped soldier and he was carrying a Schmeisser machine pistol on over his chest. So I had my big 45 pistol in the pocket of my blue jacket and I, I fired two rounds as we were taught to do at him at about that range, about six yards. And caught him with the two rounds in the arch of the ribs. And he just went over backwards. The wood by that time was full of Germans because they were holding the Vauban, Vauban fort at the top and um, had anti-aircraft up there. And were, the, he was obviously one of the patrols coming out. But he, he was alone. Perhaps he got lost, poor chap. Anyway, we had to haul him into the undergrowth. And I felt really quite squeamish about it, probably because we'd had to lie beside him and the blue bottles were already working the blood, you know. By late summer 1944, the Maki were in the ascendant. General de Gaulle became anxious to assert his political authority on the country. Foreign saboteurs and the like were no longer welcome, and all British agents were ordered out. I was furious, yes, at being given marching orders by someone who'd sat in his fanny all, all through the war, <laughs> eating well in Barroso. Miller flew home in early October 1944, eight months before VE Day, having received no official thanks from the new French government. After the war, Miller was passing through Paris and was summoned to meet General de Gaulle, who'd heard of his exploits. So we went to the goal in the Avalide, where he sat with his long legs all sort of crushed up. And he was very nice to me. He thanked me and said, you know, you were a good officer and the thing seems to have been well run, the Mackey was well run and not like all of them, you know, <laughs> getting a snip every now and then. Much as he welcomed de Gaulle's praise, Miller's greatest testimony comes from the Mackey themselves. He liked it. He liked taking risks. He was really respected by the Maquisades because he wasn't a fake. For Miller, the few months he spent in the woods and hills of northeastern France were the best times of his life. Yes, I loved it. It came out fit as a flea. I had a bloody good time, a very good time.